you say something about this and all of a sudden you are labeled racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic. You, you thought we were going deep on the 40K. Oh God, no. Now, now we're going to go deep because I can explain why this is happening. Yeah, that's what we're here for. Let's do it, Arch. This is all part of the same movement. Uh, as I mentioned, I, uh, I did a video on this a couple times now with one I did today, uh, breaking down the roots of this, because this is all a political agenda coming in here. Vanguard, BlackRock, they have a political agenda, which we know as ESG in DEI. But to really understand this, we've got to go back to 1930s Europe. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, with a man by the name of Antonio Gramsci. Have you ever heard of him? No. Oh, really? Dev hasn't Antonio told me about what? Gramsci. I'm surprised. Okay. All right, I'm doing a little digging. Antonio Gramsci was an Italian socialist uh, who was defeated by Mussolini, the other flavor of socialism in Italy, and imprisoned for the rest of his life. Gramsci was an absolute and utter genius of political philosophy. He was beyond clever. And he is the reason why this is happening to us today because of the political doctrine that he created. And what was that? Um, he came up with the idea. So we got to go back to the 1800s now. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. <laughs> All right. Uh, but the various socialist uh, theories and thinkers of the time were like, okay, um, the world is unjust. The peasants will recognize this and the proletariat will rise up against the monarchies, against the capitalists, and they will create a more equal state, the communist state, the socialist state. But then years passed and years passed and years passed and decades passed and the peasants refused to rise up. And so a lot of the socialists are wondering, what the fuck's going on here? Because even the revolution in Russia, who, who started in the Russian revolution? It wasn't the peasantry. It wasn't the workers. It was Lenin, a man from Germany sent to Russia with the express intent of destabilizing Russia. And his revolutionaries were from the cities. In fact, the Russian revolutionaries would go on then to primarily persecute the farmers, the people who were supposed to be rising up. And the theory then was like, okay, how do we explain why the peasants aren't fucking revolting? Like, They'll be better off under socialism, surely. And uh, Mussolini decided to solve this problem by launching his own violent revolution. Uh, Gramsci, on the other hand, thought to himself, okay, the peasants aren't revolting because capitalism and democracies have built the world around them. They have, they have built the prison where people live in normality and think, okay, this is just how the world works now. Uh, why should I fight against it? Capitalism is normal. Democracy is normal. There's no point in resisting, especially as I'm pretty happy. I'm fat. I have a roof over my head. Life's good. Why would I, why would I risk all of this by picking up a gun? And so Gramsci thought that the revolution was impossible unless all of those structures of normalcy, all of the institutions around you, all of the ideas and thoughts of modern democracy needed to be replaced by socialist ideals. Only then, once the world had already been culturally captured, the message could the revolution commence. Well, behaviors are going to have to change, and this is one thing we're, going to, we're asking companies. Uh, you have to force behaviors, and at BlackRock, we are forcing behaviors. Okay. What does that have to do with Warhammer 40K in the year 2024? Well, this was a very long-term plan, because this idea of cultural capture began then and has been going on all the way up until now, where the idea is you don't capture the institutions directly. You don't march up to the Capitol building and go, socialism, please. You go into a hobby and you go, wouldn't it be nice if this was more equitable and d diverse, both socialist political points? And then you browbeat them. You go like, That's, it's very... It's very racist what you're doing here. Shouldn't we fix this? And since our world of normality, racism is bad, we go, oh, oh, oh okay, uh, sure. We, we, we've got some black people in here. We'll, we'll put in some more. And they go, okay, that's nice, but you're not speaking to the systemic systems of racism you've got here. And you're like, oh, okay, uh, how do we fix it? And then you bring them into the structures. Now they begin to change the values of society. Before, um, think of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. It was okay. an example of diversity and representation that was entirely natural. We were just like, okay, wouldn't it be funny if we had a black family 
who behaves basically like white people. And then we add in Will Smith, who's the ghetto kid. All right, cool. Everybody loved it. Everybody adored it. And we had a whole wave of diverse sitcoms with black characters, for example, and black stand-up comedians. Right. That was natural. This is not natural. Because 40K always has had black characters. It's always had women characters. And so to then go in and say, it's not enough is the political ideology. Because then you get in, you get authority, you get power, and then you begin instituting further reforms until eventually you arrive at the position that Star Wars arrived at a few years ago where the past must die, kill it if you have to, because now you're replacing what came before. This is the same reason why we're tearing down statues, for example, because we cannot acknowledge the past because the past is of the old system and we are trying to replace that system. We are trying to eradicate it entirely. But there have also been a series of attacks on antiquities and cultural heritage. And today there is both condemnation and sadness over a video showing what happened this week. In the video, Islamic State militants knock statues to the floor, take sledgehammers to centuries old artifacts, even employ a jackhammer to reduce a work to rubble. Yes, and of course this is done for, again, political reasons. That's the key of it. I, I know this is a lot to... Uh, absorb <laughs> right off the yeah, bat this is a lot but maybe i can um i can i can bring up like a simpler example of this right uh the, the you know the original pride flag i'm sure right? yes uh, pride began as a movement mm -hmm. with genuine complaints okay like we are being harassed we want to have the same rights as everybody else okay entirely fair enough and it had a pride flag that remained unchanged for about 30 years because most of their political grievances were simply just treat us like everybody else. Nothing wrong with that. Then uh, in 2017, Philadelphia commissioned their own pride flag. That's the one with the black and the brown stripes on top. Now, what does race have to do with pride? Right. Nothing. Right. Like, the entire point of pride was that it was universally humanist. You can be gay and black or brown or yellow or white. It doesn't really matter. So now they added race into it. That was weird. And immediately thereafter, just a couple of years, the trans pride flag was invented. And then a year after that, the trans and intersex pride flag was invented. And just a couple of weeks ago, London created their own pride flag with two pyramids now eating into the pride colors. Uh, this is a beautiful illustration of what happens as the ideology grows more and more political, because you're ever pushing forwards toward a more socialist future, a more equity, more diversity, et cetera, et cetera, until eventually the original pride colors, they're now half of the flag. That's so stupid. 